Hi, I'm the Glyph. This is Authentic Danger. We are here on behalf of the Artisan Alliance to show you how to cast a keycap. Whether you're an established caster or want to become one, this video is intended to be a clear and concise guide to making keycaps using silicone and resin. We'll also be using the L2K adapters, which I designed to provide repeatable, production quality casts using Legos. I wanted to provide an easy to use, low cost alternative that allows artisans of all levels to make better caps. There's a lot of really cool things you can do with these adapters, so stay tuned for future videos where we go over more advanced techniques. This video provides a foundation of processes we each use on a professional level. But in this hobby, there's a lot of room for personal opinion and expression, so we encourage you to experiment on your own. All the technical information, products, and links can be found in the description. So with all that out of the way, let's get to it. This is everything we'll use to make our keycap. A selection of Legos, an L2K adapter with a master keycap, silicone, resin, and an assortment of consumables to mix and dispense them. We'll cover these things in more detail as needed, but first, let's make our mold box. For this mold, we're using a single 1U MX compatible keycap as the master. This is the corresponding L2K adapter, and we can see it has a rounded corner that's designed for mold orientation. We always want to have a good seal between components in our mold, so make sure mating surfaces are clear of debris. Be careful of orientations if you're using an asymmetrical keycap, and make sure all components are fully seated. A mold box can be as big as you want, but to minimize silicone usage, we like to leave a one-pip border around the contents. It's important to stagger our layers as we're building to prevent silicone from leaking out through small gaps between the bricks. The height of the box isn't that important so long as it's tall enough to noticeably stand above your master. Our mold box is ready to go, but we need to choose a silicone before we're ready to move on to anything else. There's a whole lot of different options out there and it can be really overwhelming to try to navigate this information if you don't know what you're looking for. Before I show you which silicone we used in this video, I'm gonna walk you through a spec sheet so you can have a better understanding of how we typically come to these decisions. The first thing we care about when looking at silicone is whether or not it's platinum or tin cure. Platinum-based silicone generally captures better surface detail and has a much longer mold life compared to tin. Unfortunately, it will not cure in the presence of certain chemicals such as sulfur or vinyl, which makes it difficult or impossible to use in certain mixed material applications. Tin silicone tends to have inferior mechanical properties compared to platinum, but is significantly more robust when it comes to cure inhibition. Mixing ratio can be listed either by weight or by volume. With some effort, you can make your own conversion between the two if your preferred measurement process is not listed. Working time, or pot life, is the absolute maximum time you should be working with your silicone after mixing. Cure, or demold time, is the absolute minimum you should wait before interacting with your mold. You'll want enough working time to pour your molds, and a short enough cure to fit your casting schedule. Viscosity refers to how thick the silicone is after mixing. A larger number means thicker, which will be harder to pour and more likely to trap air in your mold. It is also more likely to need degassing, so when in doubt, keep this number low. Durometer, or hardness, refers to how hard your cured silicone is. On the shore scale, a larger number refers to harder materials. Firmer silicone keeps mold registration accurate and is easier to work with for small parts. Softer silicone is only useful if you're dealing with extreme undercuts and need to stretch your mold a lot while demolding. Shrinkage refers to how much dimensional shift your mold will undergo while curing. If using custom masters, it's possible to design for shrinkage, but otherwise this number should be kept as low as possible. There will always be trade-offs between all the characteristics of a silicone, so it's important to consider the specific needs of your application while making your choice. This application isn't particularly fancy, so we're going to go ahead and use our favorite platinum silicone, Moldstar 30. This silicone has a reasonable cure time of 6 hours, an above average firmness, and a low enough viscosity that you don't need to degas in a vacuum. The next question is how much do we pour? I got tired of guessing how much silicone to use each time I made a mold, so I designed a calculator that you can use right from your workbench to get the numbers you need. First, we input the size of our mold box. Next, we tell the calculator about everything inside our mold box. In this case, we have a single 1U DSA keycap on a 3-pip L2K adapter. If you're using any sculpted or non-standard masters, do your best to approximate their volume. Finally, we input the type of silicone we're using. This number is the volume of silicone we want to end up with in our mold box, 
but we also need to account for silicone that will remain in and on our mixing equipment. I find 10% works well for me. Today we're measuring by volume, so we're going to use graduated syringes to get the right amounts of parts A and B and dispense them into our mixing cup. Stir until the silicone is a uniform color, taking care to scrape the sides and bottom of your cup as you go. This mold doesn't have any difficult geometry, so we're clear to pour. Try to minimize the air trapped in your mold by pouring slowly into a low spot. The first half of our mold is ready to cure, so now it's time to put it in a pressure pot. Pressure pots are essential tools for getting quality casts, and we'll be using one numerous times in this video. While all these steps still technically work at room pressure, they will produce significantly inferior results. Here are two caps that I cast at exactly the same time using exactly the same process, except one of them was left outside the pressure pot while curing. We strongly believe that even at lower levels of casting, there's no reason to have air bubbles in your caps. This example is just ridiculous. Curing is done, so let's prepare to pour the second half. Flip over the mold box and remove the base plate. Take out the L2K adapter and master keycap. Push the silicone down until it's flush with the table in order to make room for the second part of the mold. This also prevents any possible deformation while under pressure. Because silicone bonds with other silicone, it's very important to apply mold release to prevent the halves from fusing together while curing. We didn't need to do this the first time because there was no cured silicone already in the box. Replace the master in the same orientation. It's important to achieve a tight seal with the mold to prevent new silicone from seeping under the master keycap. If you are using a cast sprue system, now would be the time to set that up. Because gluing Q-tips is time consuming, inconsistent, and potentially damaging to the master, we're going to show you a method we like better later on in the process. You already know from the calculator how much silicone is needed for this pour, so mix it up. Small spaces like the stem are particularly prone to trapping air. Before pouring the rest of the mold, we'll manually apply a small amount of silicone to these areas to make sure they are properly filled. With that out of the way, we're free to fill up the rest of the mold and put it in the pot. Everything's cured, it's time to demold. Remove the silicone from the Legos and gently peel the two halves apart. If you're curious what happens if you forget mold release, here's an example where it was poorly applied. You can clearly see where the two halves are fused, which ruins the entire mold. This is how it should work. The two halves will separate cleanly, leaving a smooth parting line and an easily removable master. The last thing we need to do before our mold is finished is add sprues, which allow air to escape as resin is being injected. I like to make sprues using a hollow needle to punch a channel in multiple locations around my mold. For this mold, I punched a sprue in each corner positioned under the edges of my master keycap. So that's literally the entire process of making two-part molds using L2K adapters. Whether you stick to 1U blanks like this mold, sculpt things on a synth, or cast Topra mod sets, the steps we just covered can stay the same for your entire casting career. Just remember, the majority of problems you'll encounter can probably be traced back to one of these things. Air trapped in tight spaces due to improperly pre-filling your mold, poorly applied mold release, or cure inhibition when using platinum silicone. It's also worth noting that the L2K adapter positions your master in the same place each time. This allows you to effortlessly swap tops and bottoms between your molds, which enables a whole lot of cool options in your casting. We'll walk you through some of these things in a future video, but I wanted to get you thinking about it and exploring on your own in the meantime. That's it for silicone. Let's go talk about resin. If you walked into a store and asked to buy resin, you might get a funny look. There are actually a bunch of different types of resins out there, such as epoxy or polyester. But in this video, when we say resin, we're specifically referring to polyurethane resin. As far as keycaps are concerned, polyurethane resins tend to have great mechanical properties, work well with a wide range of colorants and additives, and are relatively easy to work with from a safety perspective. That being said, there's still a ton of different options out there, and it can be really overwhelming to try to find the ones that you want. Just like with silicones though, we're gonna walk through a spec sheet See what we can learn. The first thing we care about for resin is the body color. This refers to the core color of the cured resin with no additional additives. A translucent resin gives very different aesthetic results than an opaque resin, so be very aware of which you are choosing. 
When it comes to specifications, you'll probably notice a lot of similarities with the silicone spec sheet we looked at earlier. While these terms mean the same thing on a physical level, given the different applications, we don't necessarily want to prioritize them in the same way. Resin hardens very quickly once the pot life expires, so it's vital that there is enough time to fully accommodate your workflow. Having resin seize in the middle of your casting session is a real bad time, so err on the side of longer if you're not sure. Keycaps are friction fit and can take quite a beating while living on a keyboard. Resin hardness is very important for durability and performance, so when in doubt, try to choose a harder resin. Everything else is pretty similar to silicone and involves just as many trade-offs. Carefully consider your application and what to prioritize when choosing which resin to use. Keycaps would be pretty boring if they only came in clear and white, so let's take a look at what goes into making them a little more colorful. Pigment commonly comes in two forms, dry and liquid. This is dry pigment, which is designed to be added to your resin to change its color. It is easy to portion by weight, but requires a lot of mixing to fully integrate into your liquid resin during casting. This is a liquid pigment. It's dry pigment, which someone else has already combined with a binder agent. This makes it much easier to mix with your resin, but it can be quite difficult to handle due to how concentrated it is. The pigment choices you make heavily affect the aesthetic of your keycap, and there really is no right answer here. Colors and other additives are an art form on their own, so we urge you to experiment and be creative in this area. We're about to start working with some chemicals that may or may not be dangerous to your health depending on your beliefs and practices. While you are always free to observe any level of safety that you like, please evaluate your gear, your space, and any other concerns before working with these materials. Remember, only you are responsible for your personal safety. Let's get down to business and make ourselves a keycap. I always start by cleaning my mold with alcohol to remove any fingerprints, residue, and particulate that I don't want to become part of my final cap. Once that dries, I'll usually apply a thin layer of mold release to make demolding easier and extend the life of my mold. Today we're using Smoothcast 325, which has a pretty short pot life of two and a half minutes. And this clock starts ticking as soon as I combine parts A and B. To prevent unnecessary time stress, I'll take this chance to add liquid pigment to just part B and combine thoroughly. After making sure my molds are ready and I have all the things I need for the next step, it's time to add part A of my resin and start the clock. Thoroughly mix both parts of resin together and load them into a syringe. Just like with silicone, air can easily get trapped in small spaces and corners of our mold. Carefully pre-fill these areas before injecting the main body of resin to help prevent any bubbles in the final keycap. Reassemble the mold and slowly inject resin into your favorite sprue. The goal when injecting resin is to force out all the air in the mold, so seeing resin come out of each sprue is a good sign. Remove your syringe slowly so suction doesn't pull air back down the sprue. Feel free to gently massage your mold to try and dislodge any rogue bubbles. Then get that baby under pressure. There's a key cap in here. Let's get it out. Wiggle the two halves of the mold apart and set the empty one aside. Grab your favorite cutting implement and snip through any sprues that are holding your key cap in place, taking care not to damage your mold in the process. Once the cap is free, carefully trim any unwanted resin left behind from the casting process. Give it a few passes on some sandpaper to get a smooth bottom, then give it a final wash down to remove oils and particulates. I'd call this cap a success. It's fully cured, there are no bubbles, and the color came out exactly as intended. Not every cap is a success though, so let's take a look at a few problems we commonly see and the first things you can do to try to solve them. Air bubbles are a big problem for people when casting. If you get a lot of little bubbles like this, you're probably not using a pressure pot. If you already are, try using more pressure. If you're seeing pockets of air near a sprue, you're either accidentally injecting air while filling or sucking air back into your mold once it's filled. Check for air trapped in your syringe while injecting and take care when removing your syringe or squeezing your mold. If you're seeing deformation in tight areas or corners, try pre-filling more thoroughly. Sometimes you make a beautiful cap, but it just doesn't fit on a switch properly. This could be too tight or too loose, but either way it's a problem. Check the shrinkage for the materials you're using and make sure your master has room to account for this change in dimension. Sometimes your cap will be soft, tacky, or even just a pile of goop. This is almost always a problem with your resin. 
The first thing to check is that you're measuring accurately and mixing completely while preparing your resin. If the cap is tacky, try using less pigment. If your cap isn't hardening, you may be demolding too soon, so wait a little longer. The goal of this video was to provide a foundation for casting quality keycaps using L2K adapters. We've seen a lot of people across the community struggling with the same common problems, so we wanted to create a starting point for more intelligent discussion about casting technology. I designed L2K adapters with both beginner casters and established artisans in mind. I don't think you should have to design your own hardware to get quality molds, and I would rather see people put their energy into more creative aspects of the hobby. We've covered a lot of ground, so be sure to check out the description for links and additional information. Let us know if you'd like to see videos that take a closer look into specific topics, or just have general questions about the casting process. Look for more projects from the Artisan Alliance, and reach out if you want to get involved. I'm Authentic Danger. And I'm The Glyph. We'll see you next time.